Procedural generation in gaming may not be a phrase that we are all familiar with as gamers, but it is an important and often necessary option in game development nonetheless. And considering its relevance in games such as Minecraft and No Man's Sky, we have obvious reference points to the sheer power and benefit of procedural generation. In this video, we'll be exploring the procedural generation of video game worlds and its merits. When we talk about procedural generation, we talk about the generation of in-game elements by algorithms programmed into a game's code, rather than through manually created and set in-game elements. For example, in platformer titles such as some of the Mega Man games, levels, items, and enemy placement are generally set, per the design wishes of the level designers. This is manual generation. If Mega Man games were procedurally generated, then room designs would be randomized, with platforms placed in new and unexpected areas each time you would play through them. The same thing might be said for some enemies, so if you were trying to beat this procedurally generated Mega Man game, a good amount of technical ability would help you place shots or move so as to evade enemies or progress through the levels. But there isn't really such a thing as practicing to beat a procedurally generated game, because in theory each playthrough is a unique experience. Contrast some of the more conventional platformer games like most Mario or Kirby titles to something like No Man's Sky. The planets are procedurally generated. As you approach a planet, the elements that compose the planet are generated by that game. That planet is then composed once discovered, and as you explore and approach the planet, eventually making contact with the surface and disembarking to visit this foreign and very new world, the game crafts more of the details that give the individual planet life. It's all being done on the fly. Once you leave the planet that No Man's Sky has just made, you can traverse through more of outer space and No Man's Sky will repeat this process. When will the new planet appear? Where will it appear? In which directions do you have to travel to find this planet or any other new planets? These aren't exactly the right questions to be asking about procedurally generated content. The answers you're looking for aren't predetermined. The answers, as mentioned before with the Mega Man example, are instead randomized. The game doesn't know the answer until it's good and ready and based upon your actions, and then, whenever then is, its algorithms will have decided to draw a new planet. One very important merit of procedural generation is, as have been mentioned earlier, the creation of novel content. Each playthrough or interaction with a new environment over a set of predetermined space should contain a new configuration of elements over an infinite amount of tests. This uniqueness provides novelty for the game player, which makes repeated playthroughs new and fresh experiences. Maximizing novelty increases the likelihood of retaining the player's attention, even if the differences between incremental room generations is minimal. It's also worth emphasizing that in procedurally generated worlds, the game player generally doesn't know what to expect. The algorithmically generated game elements are randomized, and something like this element of surprise can also be helpful for player retention. Another major benefit is the mass amount of content procedural generation is able to produce. Fewer elements have to be stored, as they would be by manual generated content. Instead, the algorithms generate random configurations of content placement to populate game environments. This also means a lot less in terms of content to design and place for game developers. Imagine No Man's Sky planets all made by hand. There's no telling when that game is completed. This is a significant amount of savings in terms of labor. In practice, games tend to use a mix of manually generated content and procedurally generated content. This would mean something like having artists crafting rainbow trees of their own rather than having game code that draws it for them. While games are all composed of art and music assets, the essence of games is in complex math and programming code, that which gives objects function, direction, and a sense of life. Even in games or programs that simplify the game design process, such as RPG Maker, there is a great mass of programming that underlies the operation of all video games. To go back to the example of rainbow trees, what the game code would do is decide how many of these pre-designed rainbow trees to place in an environment and where, doing so through a procedural generation algorithm. This example is just talking about the individual placements of trees or game objects, but procedural generation allows for the crafting of game worlds on a much bigger scale. We're talking about using these same types of algorithms to draw the terrain of planets and construct the clouds in the sky. In procedural generation, there are two main types of content creation, ontogenetic approaches and teleological approaches. 
To speak broadly, ontogenetic algorithms are designed with achieving a particular end result, while teleological approaches achieve their goals through models of processes that build up to some finished result. This is a simplification of the two approaches, but it's sort of like the difference between working backwards from having an answer, the ontogenetic approach, and working forward starting from the bottom, the teleological approach. One example that can be used to illustrate the difference in approaches is the creation of a mountain on a map. With the ontogenetic approach, you might simply aim to create an algorithm with the goal of crafting something with the definition or characteristics of a mountain, using sophisticated functions to give that mountain a more realistic and unique form rather than something overly simplified, like a pyramid. With a teleological approach, you would, given a set of space in a game world, use functions that alter that given space to craft and populate the environment, ones based on nature that simulate the formation of mountains on any planet. You're trying to make a mountain, but it's expected that the algorithms will yield that result because it's known that natural phenomenon leads to the formation of mountains. So we use randomized algorithms to simulate that mountain crafting and environmental population. You can incorporate both approaches in drawing an in-game world, using teleological-oriented algorithms to craft the terrain that you walk on, while using ontogenetic algorithms to craft cloud formations, with as many algorithms as necessary to create a fully formed video game world, such as what you might see in No Man's Sky. You can also lean heavily into one approach or the other, with either having different types of benefits depending on what world design task you're trying to complete. In essence, video game development has evolved significantly since the days of Nintendo and the Sega Mega Drive, capable of delivering experiences more complicated and massive than what we were previously used to. And yet, games such as Rogue and Diablo have been employing procedural generation to create unique dungeons, and those games were released in 1980 and 1996, respectively. Procedural generation can also be used to create endless runner games by using algorithms that determine the placement of obstacles or open spaces for your character to travel through on the path that lies ahead. Have you ever thought about game development? If you could make any game you wanted, what type of game would you make? Be sure to let us know in the comment section below, and as always, thanks for watching. And that about does it for this video. If you enjoyed what you watched and want to see more from Gaming Bolt, you can always hit that subscribe button and turn on the bell icon next to it. That way you will never miss any of our videos.